I am a thoracic surgeon at Cambridge Health Alliance and also Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston. I've been with CHA and Beth Israel Deaconess for five years. And during that time, um, the lung cancer screening program at CHA has been instituted and grown tremendously. So I'd first like to review um, lung cancer screening at CHA. I would like to share a video of some patient stories of two very special patients at CHA who have been impacted by our lung cancer screening program. And then I also would like to leave some time for uh, our smoking right. cessation uh, counselor, Susan, to discuss that, which is an integral part of our lung cancer screening program. I have 10 minutes to talk, so I will be as brief as possible. Um, I have no disclosures relevant to this presentation. I provide care to patients at CHA Cambridge. I have a clinic in Everett as well, and then Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston. The CHA Lung Cancer Screening Program is state of the art. It is a multidisciplinary program that is led by Dr. Alex White, the Chief of Pulmonary, but includes members of the lung cancer treatment team, including myself, medical oncology, radiology, radiation oncology at Mount Auburn Hospital, um, pulmonary, and others. We also have dedicated lung nodule navigators that help us keep track of patients with abnormal scans, communicate with providers, and make sure appropriate follow-up imaging is done. We have regular monthly review of abnormal CT scans in a multidisciplinary fashion. We also have a regular thoracic tumor board, um, which is a multidisciplinary conference for patients with either suspected or known uh, cancer diagnoses at CHA. Who is eligible for lung screening? Um, we have a website dedicated to this, and I have some links at the, at the end of this presentation. But it includes patients age 50 to 80 with no signs or symptoms of lung cancer. They may have smoked um, for a pack a day for 20 years, current smokers, or people who have quit smoking within the past 15 years are eligible. I'd like to share with you some patient stories about lung screening, which can be find, found on our website. I started smoking when I was about 13. You know, our parents used to smoke cigarettes in the house. And they used to say, here, take this cigarette and go light it on the stove. Puff it, make sure it's lit. And I would smoke off and on, and it just became everyday habit. And I've been smoking for like over 30 years. By the uh, age of 14 years old, I really had the habit to, uh, to smoke. I was not uh, mature enough you know, to realize that smoking would cause lung cancer. Last year, I went to my primary care. He told me, he says, well, now CHA is doing a, um, a chest uh, CTs for people that used to smoke. I said, well, you know, doctor, my uncle died of lung cancer. My brother died of lung cancer. Well, why not? You know, set me up. You know, I want to do it. One day I was at work and I was bending over helping someone and all of a sudden I just got a shoulder breath and I couldn't, couldn't breathe. So um, I went to emergency room. They made an appointment with my primary care doctor. I had um, CT scans and it showed that I had um, emphysema and small lung nodules. The CT scan, it was painless. You go in, they have you put it on a, a little gown and you lie on the table and you go into this little circular machine. It's really quick, you don't feel anything. And it's over two minutes, three minutes. I did that and then within probably a day or two later, he calls me up and he says, okay, I just got the results from your chest uh, scan. It's, it shows it, it's okay, you know, it has too little, uh, Dots, like he said, but I don't think it's anything to worry about. But maybe next year we can uh, repeat. So uh, this year on April 9, I had a, another appointment with him. On the following day, he calls me up, 
And he says, well, I got the results. It has grown from last year. There is a doctor, a surgeon. Can I set you up with her? I uh, he had surgery. She was able to uh, remove the cancer. And as a matter of fact, she had to remove part of the lung. When I found out that I had uh, emphysema and lung nodules, it wasn't a matter of, okay, it was a choice. This is real. It was hard. I didn't want to stop. Believe me, I enjoy smoking. But I had to stop. If I didn't have the emphysema, I don't think I would have known I had the nodules because I had no, you don't feel it. You don't know that they're in there growing. I was not sick. I could run. I could walk the seven flights of stairs from this hospital without stopping. Had I waited maybe two or three years, I probably wouldn't be here explaining my case that went so easy. Go to your doctor. Don't be afraid of doctors. They're here to help you, believe it or not. And if you think you can't afford it, worry about that later. There's always help and programs out there that can help you. It's, it's, it's important. Do it for your children. Do it for yourself. Just do it. Thank you. I think that our patient stories are often the most powerful message that we can send. Um, and those are two very special patients that we have um, at CHA. On our website, you can see part of the screen here. We do have a direct phone number for um, patients to call if they're interested in learning about lung screening or signing up or if they're eligible. There's also a get more information where you can plug in your information in a brief history and someone from the lung screening program will reach out. The lung screening program is very good at making sure that primary care providers are looped into the process every step of the way, but they're also there to support that process and help the providers navigate lung cancer screening um, at CHA, follow-up imaging, et cetera. Um, Interventions for lung cancer can include multiple different treatment modalities. They do not necessarily mean if we do detect a cancer that someone does need surgery. There are some patients who are not candidates for surgery or do not want surgery. There are also some stages of cancer in which surgery is not indicated. We always review concerning scans or confirm lung cancer diagnoses in a multidisciplinary fashion and discuss an individualized tailored treatment plan for that patient, which can include any of the following, including chemotherapy or immunotherapy, radiation, microwave ablation, or surgery. The picture is an illustration of what a thoracoscopic or vast procedure might look like. I also perform robotic surgery at BIDMC as well. I have a few links to more information for both patients and providers on my slides, which will be shared. There's a direct link to the lung cancer screening site on the CHA website, the thoracic surgery program, and there's also the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force guidelines, which includes lung cancer screening for the eligible patients we discussed earlier. Thank you very much. And I'd like to um, pass this talk over to Susan to talk about smoking cessation, which is an integral part of our lung cancer screening program. Great. So are there any questions for Jen before I start? No? Okay. So my name is Susan Hoy, and I'm the health educator for the tobacco treatment program here at Cambridge Health Alliance and I do telephone outreach to our patients who have been referred for um, tobacco treatment or smoking cessation, however you want to phrase it. Um, most patients are referred through um, an EPIC referral um, when their providers ask if they've smoked in the last, um, I think, year or so, or if they are smoking at the time of the visit. Um, I do the telephone outreach, and we talk about um, I get a little bit of a history from the folks in terms of how long they've been smoking, how much they smoke, their past quit attempts, 
if they have them, and then get a sense of what they'd like to do moving forward and whether that's cutting down or quitting or you know if, if they're ready to make a quit attempt or if they're not. And then we talk about the various methods um, that can help people quit smoking. Um, there, there are many nicotine replacement options, the patch, the gum, the lozenge, the inhaler and the nasal spray are options that contain nicotine. There were two forms of medication that were available to patients, Chantix and uh, Bupropion. Chantix has been off the market since uh, June because there's a high concentrate, concentration of nitrosamines in um, the medication. And so Pfizer, who is manufacturing it, has taken it off the market um, until they can uh, re-tweak the, the formulation. So it's not available for patients. And I hear a lot that um, um, patients are a little bit sad about that and feel like there's not an alternative. So part of my job is to really delve into the alternatives that exist um, um, and that there are other options that will help them quit or cut down. Um, we can also refer patients to the QuitWorks program, which is a little can do a little bit more in-depth telephone coaching. I usually try to talk to patients one or two times um, after the initial contact, just sort of see how they're doing a follow-up to make sure that they've received their medication, make sure that they know how to use it and that they're using it properly, which can be um, uh, which can be a problem. You know, I have had a couple of patients who, um, you know, when you use, for example, when you use a nicotine lozenge, you put it here and you just let it dissolve. Um, some of our patients use medication that they need to put under their tongue and let it dissolve. And so that can be confusing. And so I've had a few people who say, you know, that nicotine thing, that didn't work very well. I put it under my tongue and it really doesn't taste good and I and um, I don't I'm not using it anymore and so I'll go over you know really where it should be and um, how you should use it so for me the value of calling once or twice is just to make sure everything is in place and um, if there's any questions they need to be answered um, making referrals to the tobacco treatment program is done through an epic referral um, because I'm the only one doing the program for all of CHA, we are behind, we, I am behind right now. So if you have someone who really needs to be talked to urgently, you can send me a staff message through um, StaffNet and I will, uh, that will sort of be able to prioritize that person or you can email me or call me. Um, patients can also call me directly. Um, the number is 617-591-4516. That's my direct line. Uh, so they can leave a confidential message and I'm the only one that answers it. Um, as I said, we can also make referrals to the QuitWorks program. They can offer people a little bit more coaching, maybe once a week for a month or so to sort of get people in a better, stronger place to be able to make a quit attempt, they're also able to send a month's worth of free medication um, to folks as long as it's nicotine replacement like the patch for gum or the lozenge. And, you know, watching the video, it's really important. The, the patients were so, you know, honest and wonderful and particularly um, the woman, Barbara, um, she was so great about saying, you know, I, I didn't want to quit. Um, I I had to because I got sick. And so many of our patients are in that space. You know, I'll call, I'll call them and it's a cold call because they may have heard their doctor saying, you're gonna get a call from tobacco treatment and then, you know, it'll go right over their head. And they'll say, I'm not interested in quitting. You know, I like, I like smoking. And so we have a conversation about maybe cutting down. If you cut down a few a day with that, um, do you think you could do that rather than just quitting all at once? Because that can be a little bit frightening, a little bit overwhelming, especially for people who've been smoking since teenagers. When you smoke, when you start smoking, when you're very young as a teenager, you get addicted really 
fast and it's much harder to quit than if you started smoking when you were a young adult. So these are the things that we go over. Um, and then we have some literature that we can send out in terms of what the withdrawal symptoms are and um, what some helpful social media sites might be for people who are uh, on the internet or, or comfortable with using social media. So I do have a question in the chat. And is there a difference uh, for the treatment for quitting vaping? There is. Um, the difference might be in terms of what you use, what nicotine replacement you use, because depending on what you're vaping, for example, if you're using Juul, one pot of Juul is equal to between one and two packs of cigarettes. So if you use two pods of Juul a day, you're getting the nicotine equivalent of almost four packs of cigarettes. And because vaping is so, um, you know, you don't inhale anything and you blow out the smoke and it's very easy and it's kind of cool. Um, you don't really, you don't really get that you're, you're, flooding your system with so much nicotine. And so it's harder to, it's harder to think about getting that much nicotine to, into your brain and into your system. And it's harder to um, get off of it. And so you might, we might talk about using more nicotine replacement than if you were smoking a pack of cigarettes, but it's the same idea, you know, that you want to um, not expose yourself to the level of nicotine. And the hard thing about vaping is that we've spent so long telling people, you know, when you're smoking, it's the smoke that does the damage to your body. So we want you to not smoke. And then vape, the vape people come out and say, well, you're not inhaling any smoke. So that's kind of good for you. You know, let's take back our freedom. But at the same time, you're getting addicted to the nicotine and you're not going to be able to stop um, vaping without some kind of intervention and help. There aren't any other questions, but I have a question. Uh, you know, as I have done my research doing presentations at Cambridge Health Alliance, I find that smoking is the number one risk factor for many, many diseases. And uh, a lot of people that I run into say that, you know, they've been smoking for all these years and they're a lost cause. But that's not true, right? When they, as soon as you stop smoking, there, there are benefits that you begin to get. Is that true? It's true, uh, you know, one thing our, our bodies know how to do is right themselves, you know, when they have a little help. So if you stop, you know, after your last cigarette, even if it's your last cigarette of the day, you know, your, your blood pressure starts to settle and your blood gases start to settle. And if you continue that, if you don't smoke, if you successfully quit, you know, your, your risks of heart attack go down, your risks of, you know, a lot of chronic diseases go down. If you have diabetes, your blood sugar is able to, reg, you know, you're able to regulate your blood sugar um, a little bit better if you're not smoking. Um, people who've been smoking for decades can say, you know, I, I, I've heard, you know, I'm a lost cause. Uh, I've heard it's the only thing I have left, which is kind of heartbreaking when you think about it. Um, and people also, the reason I think the, the early lung cancer screenings are so critical is because there are people who've been smoking for decades who walk around really terrified that they already have something really badly wrong with them, but they just don't want to find out. So, you know, we will, I will hear people saying to me, um, my best friend smoked for 50 years and then he quit. And then two months later he had cancer and it was everywhere and he was dead within a month. And so what the association is made not to the smoking for 50 years, but to the quitting. And so this feeling that, you know, if you quit, then you do all the damage and then, and then it's too late. So the, which is not sciencey, but now that we have the early, detection, people can really see the connection between things like cancer 
nodules grow pretty slowly. They don't grow all at once when you quit smoking. So if you look at over the span of a few years, you're able to really catch it early. And then if you combine that with quitting smoking, you're really um, in a position to be in better health eventually. Like that gentleman who said, my father died of lung cancer, my brother died of lung cancer. You know, he's someone who maybe before the screening would have said, well, you know, I'm just probably gonna die of lung cancer too. But now he has the tools and the sort of medical professionals to say to him, that doesn't have to happen to you. You know, you, we can help you instead of just sort of accepting that. Um, That's wonderful. I have two more questions. To you, Dr. Wilson, what is the recovery mm -hmm. on average after surgery if, need, if needed? Um, it is variable. Um, and it depends on the patient's state of health coming into surgery, as well as the type of operation needed is the real answer. Um, you know, in general, minimally invasive surgery does get patients out of the hospital and recovered fully from surgery more quickly. The length of stay can vary on average after a vast procedure from one night from a simple type of procedure to two to four nights for something slightly more complex, or certainly there are outliers if they experience a complication, which is quite rare um, after surgery. So it can vary. I typically tell patients that on average, it takes them about three weeks total to feel back to their complete baseline. And in the time after surgery, it's a slow process back to that level. Thank you. And what are the health risks of vaping? So if we can even remember a time before COVID, there's the health risks are lung diseases that can be caused by vaping. That, would you agree, doctor? Um, there was a, a huge mm -hmm. problem in 2019 in the fall with, with um, I think it was called Evali. There was a, a, a many people were getting really sick from a lung disease caused by vaping, and it became sort of um, a big issue in health and public health. And people were encouraged to stop vaping. And the the I think the um, the head of the FDA at the time um, wanted to um, discontinue um, vaping products. And then three months later. At the end of 2019, this weird, you know, virus started coming out of China, and people sort of took attention off that. But there are serious lung diseases that a lot of people were getting from vaping, not just nicotine, but vaping marijuana. It's not. Um, it's never a great thing to sort of inhale to sort of inhale anything into your lungs. You know, um, we really should just leave our lungs alone and let them do what they're meant to do. Um, so for people who want to cut down or want to um, quit smoking and sort of want to have the hand to mouth or experience of having something in their hand, I always talk to people and doctors about the prescription nicotine inhaler because it's a similar, you know, you have it in your hand, you sip on it, but there's no vape, there's no smoke, there's no nothing that gets into your lungs. It's a mist in the back of your throat that sort of gives you that satisfaction. Well, I think um, I've, unless there are any, does anybody else have any questions? I'm not seeing anything else in the, in the chat. This is incredibly important information. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, we can pass this on and, and someone will receive the benefit. Oh, we have another question. Should we be concerned with secondhand smoke? We should, uh, you know, always be concerned with secondhand smoke. We don't want to, um, we don't want to inhale any of it. It's not good. It's the reason why a lot of um, subsidized housing now in the country has gone uh, smoke free. So people who live in subsidized housing are not allowed to smoke in their units. So if we know people who smoke, we don't want to be around them when they smoke. It's going to cause some, it can cause 
asthma, it can cause emphysema, it can cause lung damage to us. So we want to minimize our contact with secondhand smoke as well. Thank you. Uh, well, I guess um, for, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Roberta Robinson. I'm marketing manager for geriatrics. I forgot to say that at the beginning. Uh, and thank you so much for this presentation. We got a lot of information across in just a short time. So thank you so much. And um, for our next Lunch and Learn, we'll, which will be in January, we'll be talking about nutrition and we'll have a cooking demo, which will be kind of fun. So thank you all for participating and um, we'll see you next month.